Not surprisingly, a growing number of intelligent thinking people are beginning to realize that all was not well with Apollo. So why aren't professionals in the aerospace industry speaking out? What could be the reason for such reticence? Well, in fact, some have spoken out. Bill Wood lives in California. He is a highly qualified scientist with degrees in mathematics, physics and chemistry. He's been granted high security clearance for a number of top secret US government projects. Wood has worked with many major contractors to the United States government, including McDonnell Douglas, and also with engineers employed on the Saturn V, the Apollo launch vehicle. For many years, Bill Wood has harbored suspicions regarding the authenticity of the Apollo record. I think that a lot of the people that I have had contact with in the aerospace industry want desperately to believe that this actually happened because it's a source of pride that their profession contributed to an achievement like this. And then, of course, within the United States, uh, we're all uh, very proud that our country made this achievement. So there's a real reluctance to question uh, anything that would destroy this lofty self-image. And for particularly for the people who worked on the Apollo program, uh, to many of them, this was the most uh, wonderful achievement that they ever produced during their entire life. And they would much rather think of it that way than to think that, like millions of other people, they were fooled into thinking they were working on something that was not genuine. A human being leaving Earth for deep space has to travel through the very thick ringed donut of trapped radiation which permanently encircles our planet. This donut contains within it two specific natural zones of very intense radiation. The whole region is named after Dr. James Van Allen, the scientist who registered this discovery in 1958. The innermost zone of the two Van Allen belts surrounds us only some 272 miles out from the Earth's surface. Entering the Van Allen radiation belt from below, you would see the radiation levels rising considerably. In fact, they're higher within the belt than they are above it, and uh, much higher than they are below it. And then as you got above the Van Allen radiation belt, the radiation would still be very, very high, but lower than this radiation that's trapped within the belt. So those form uh, a formidable barrier to the passage of manned spacecraft within these belts. This radiation varies year by year. The sun has a 11 year sunspot cycle and every 11 years it appears to repeat. And so every 11 years there's a peak of sunspot activity and this is associated with a peak of solar radiation. These peaks have been charted from the 1800s all the way to the present. And one of the recent peaks was in 1958, which is one of the reasons they decided to have the International Geophysical Year, and one of the reasons that Explorer 1 discovered the Van Allen radiation belts and, and all of this type of phenomena. And since then, the next peak was in 1969 and 1970, right when the Apollo missions were supposed to have flown through them. They couldn't have picked a worse time to try to fly a manned flight through, the, through this radiation field. So if the prediction of solar particle events is impossible, what were the means of protecting a crew when traveling through deep space in an unshielded, thin-walled rocket ship? You could use propellant, structure, other parts of the craft, the heat shield. You would design it so that you would maximize the amount of material between you and the sun for the flight, but try to avoid carrying any material just for the sake of the shielding. It would serve a dual purpose. With aluminum shielding, it's accepted that the minimum requirement is a thickness of 10 centimeters all around the craft. Was there any attempt to provide such protection? No, no. The, the walls of the craft were made as thin and light as possible. The Apollo capsule itself was, uh, was made unusually thin. Uh, in fact, they couldn't even initially uh, carry uh, enough air inside to be the equivalent to sea level air pressure. They ran it at reduced pressure in order to be able to make the walls thinner. And then the lem and other parts of the uh, craft were all made out of very thin material, very flimsy. Almost no protection at all against uh, solar radiation. So why not try using a solid shield to protect the astronauts from these dangers? Well, they didn't know how to, to 
put a shield like uh, you suggest and still be able to make the weight uh, capability of the Saturn V and carry everything to the moon. I believe that Werner von Braun's team was basically assigned the task of designing a rocket that theoretically could take men to the moon if everything worked and if there were no substantial solar radiation. But the kind of rocket that they would have had to have in order to take people to the moon, taking into account solar radiation, would have been a much more massive vehicle and they just decided that this was not something that they needed to deal with. They would just tell everybody that the radiation was okay. The surface of the moon is, of course, above the Van Allen radiation belts, and it's exposed to direct solar radiation. In 1959, they sent a spacecraft that flew past the moon. So that spacecraft could easily have, that one or others that followed it, could easily have contained instruments that showed them how lethal the radiation was. You don't need a lot of animals to uh, prove that something can't live out there. You can just send instruments that will show you that the radiation is beyond what's what can be withstood by by animals or humans. I don't know what things go match up too well or not. Ah, uh, we'll make it work. And if both the film and camera had problems with heat and cold, then how did the astronauts themselves stay cool? It was the job of the life support system, the PLIS, to regulate the body temperatures. How did that backpack actually keep an astronaut cool and likewise warm when they were working in the cold of the shadow areas? Somehow they would have to radiate the heat away, and that's not an easy task because the rate that heat is radiated away goes up according to the fourth power of the temperature difference between the radiator and the surrounding uh, medium. So you have to have a pretty hot radiator to radiate away a substantial amount of heat. It would be more likely that you would uh, eject steam because in uh, taking the heat away from the astronaut, that heat would be used to heat water up and produce steam. So you should see venting of steam if they're using water for this purpose, rather than ice actually. We never once saw any ice crystals or indeed steam emanating from the vicinity of any astronaut. Back in the US, all kinds of things were going wrong with the genesis of the Saturn V rocket. It would have taken an F-1 to get the Saturn V off if it were fully loaded. But knowing the records that were made of F-1 failures, and particularly something known as combustion instability, which was a problem right up to the end. Rocket engines have a great failing. In other words, waves can be set up in the jet that cause a perturbation that rockets back and forth inside the engine and destroys it. And I personally saw rocket, rocket engines destroyed in that way. The B-1 engine would have been much more reliable because it was a lower thrust. What observations does Bill Wood have concerning the Saturn V? For the first eight feet past the end of the exhaust nozzle of these F-1 engines, the exhaust is black. It's not glowing. It's a black exhaust. Uh, just as if you were to have some type of a uh, shroud around the end of the engine with maybe kerosene being injected into the exhaust so that when the smaller engine fires down the center of this it, it ingests air from the inside the engine compartment down into through the nozzle and mixes it with this injected kerosene and uh, it taking about eight feet for this heated kerosene to mix with air before it catches on fire behind the engine and that seems to produce this 800 foot long fuel rich flame that is uh, flapping in the air behind the Saturn V the flame behind the Saturn V doesn't look very much like the flames behind other rockets using the same propellants. There's no, no normal mode of operation that would cause an engine like that to produce this dark zone. To do that, it would have to be running so fuel rich that it would be so inefficient that it couldn't possibly produce the performance that was claimed for it. It's possible that they never really did solve the combustion efficiency problem with these F1 engine and they decided that just for show purposes they would produce an engine that produced a giant flame sort of like a huge flamethrower and we all know the flamethrowers don't produce very much thrust <laughs> <laughs>